uh, welcome to Capola Gallery. I'm here with Becca Beebe um, in her solo show on growth and form. And Becca's very kindly offered to talk us through a little bit about her work. And um, so welcome Becca, uh, thanks for coming. And um, tell us a little bit about your solo show. Um, oh, first of all, thank you for having me, <laughs> Um, this show is kind of a collection of my obsession really with a certain um, way of, of, gr- of growing and formation that happens in nature that um, I kind of noticed uh, over 20 years ago, <laughs> okay. a long time ago, um, and just how um, the same forms and structure and pattern would be found in really quite diverse areas of nature, so whether it's mammals, geographical um, formations, right. microscopic images of plants, um, yeah, it was everywhere and I kind of... A particular shape or uh, a particular repeat? Particular, well it was pattern, structure, shape, right. form, right. Um, which I kind of turned three-way junctions because I just noticed that if there was a line or a, a gap between something organic, yeah, whether it's mammal, rocks, plants, right, on um, a cellular level, on a cellular level, or on a, a, on a, a, on a macro microscopic, um, on a real life level, and on a kind of like on aerial photographs of the earth, it's on every scale. Right. Okay. So if you like, look at the veins in our wrists and the veins in the leaf, yeah. and then maybe a photograph of a river, rivers and the tree, yeah, 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 trees yeah, yeah, yeah. from above, they all have a, not exactly the same obviously, but a similar um, yes. structure. And on the same note, kind of a cross section, I still love going through like archives of um, bot- botanical and biological slides, like microscopic slides, um, right, and okay. libraries, yeah, yeah. and just yeah, like cross sections of cells of yeah. a stem of a plant or bone structure. Yeah. Um, so it's the micro macro, the fact yes. that it just repeats whether it's teeny tiny or whether it's interstellar. But something, yeah, because I, went, I went to Australia when I was. Um, in my early twenties, and just kind of on a beach in near Sydney, mm. and there are these rocks where the wind blows kind of sand and small rocks and erodes them, but they have that same. It's called Tavoni or Tafoni, mm. um, and again, it's the same pattern and structure. And I just found it incredible that that repeated so regularly, even like scales on a fish or the pattern on a giraffe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it, it is, uh, it's everywhere. So the, this exhibition is like a, a, a homage <laughs> <laughs> to that. Um, yeah, to that obsession, just, really. Because no one else seemed to be amazed by it and I was just like, What's I wanted people? people to, <laughs> and obviously not everyone can look down a microscope that's right. regularly and go, wow, oh, that's amazing. So it was to kind of make these small things more obvious and to share my like, all of it, um, but also like I learned to keep bees when I was kind of wow yes just purely so I could access the honeycomb because I found the honeycomb structure incredible obviously because it has that pattern but um, the only way I can access it with buying lumps of yeah. honeycomb mm. with honey in from a kind of beekeeper. Um, and I noticed sometimes, it's all very uniform and regular, but at the edge there might be a slightly yeah. irregular, mm-hmm. asymmetric bit. So I, um, yeah. So how old were you when you learned to beekeep? Uh, about 28. Right, okay. Maybe. Do you still keep bees? Yes, yeah, I still keep bees. Okay. So um, I learned to keep bees with a British beekeeping association course mm-hmm. um, and I'm afraid to say I was horrified. This was a long, yeah, this is kind of 15 odd years ago, so it has changed a bit, but I was a bit horrified by the intensive methods that we used in um, in beekeeping and right. that we were being taught. Um, so 
thinks that she's drone culling, which is basically killing, killing the male mm-hmm. bees because they don't collect honey. Their only use is to fertilise queens. Um, and once they've done that, that they, they, they don't. They just yeah. eat and hang about in the hive. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a lot of beekeepers would cull the drone. You can tell by the size of the the, whole, the cell in the comb, oh, okay. whether it's drone cell or a queen cell or a worker bee cell. Um, so beekeepers, I'm going way off on a tangent. That's quite fascinating. They use something called foundation, which you've probably seen. It's what they make these wax candles from. Yeah, it's yeah, got yeah, the yeah. honeycomb pattern, but it's yeah. very uniform. And most beekeepers put that in frames because right. it makes sure the honeycomb is nice and flat. Right. Dictates the cell size, so you get less drone right. cells, and it makes it easy to get this up. The um, honey frames in and out. Yeah. Um, I make sure my bees have to do whatever they want to do. I put a wild honeycomb, yeah. but I don't use foundation, and it means that my honeycomb is almost all over the place. It's got big curves and hollows and mounds in it, and the cell sizes. Very. very much more sort of much more organic yeah. structure and flow to it because um, of course that honey, that honeycomb is uh, is very evident in your jewelry you make with yes. honeycomb jewelry so what's what's the process of then obviously you've got access to this honeycomb and then you make the jewelry so what what is the actual <laughs> process um I'm not going to reveal it all because okay. it took me a year to get it right. So oh, yeah. That stemmed from, again, wanting to share this amazing yes. structure with other people, mm. but it, it's really very delicate and very yeah. breakable. Yeah. So um, I began A, working on ways to preserve it, frame it, um, make it stronger and mm. lasting, and um, these are actually. So these contain actual honeycomb nice. in them. So yeah. these were me with a starting piece of honeycomb and then I'd use acrylic and graphite right. just to build up the layers and accentuate areas. Okay. And um, yeah, just bring out forms and make it more obvious and give it a frame or structure. So the, um, the bowl here, can I get that? Yes, yes, <laughs> Um, again, it's just a way of, of showing off that incredible structure and how yeah. asymmetric and organic it can be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And so I, I'm very much into sustainable beekeeping, so yeah. I interfere as little as possible to yeah. make sure they're healthy. Um, and I take home maybe once a year, um, and I never take the honey, I leave the honey as it is. Because I just, yeah, if you take honey, particularly in the autumn, you then need to feed them sugar syrup to get the bees through the winter. Nice. Um, and because there's so many problems with bees dying out. Yeah, there are, um, definitely. Uh, so you, you basically are a beekeeper that doesn't farm honey, <laughs> yeah. which, is, but, which is extraordinary, really. I mean, yeah, I'm not sure there are other people that do it, but... Um, I suppose I, as somebody who knows nothing about beekeeping other than, I'm a bit funny, <laughs> wasps are the ones that scare me, but uh, bees, they still buzz, so I, I Well, yeah, there's an instinct. But there, there is. Um, that I, I simply assumed that you don't harm bees when you make honey. I just, I just didn't know. Well, because you're taking, yeah, there's frames and boxes, yeah. so unless you're incredibly careful and slow, bees do get crushed. And even when you are really careful, they can yeah. get squashed in between. Yeah, yeah. Because you cull yeah. the drones the drone sometimes. Yeah. Um, but also taking their honey and then feeding them sugar syrup. Um, and then a lot of bees have this colony collapse disorder and other diseases. And I just felt you need to keep bees as healthy as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I.e. they need to eat their natural food. Yeah. Um, and do you know how many bees you've got? How, how long does your hive last, or will it just keep going? I mean, oh, it I, I just don't going. know this. Oh, but yeah, it's not in depth, <laughs> so it may swarm and move on that year if it's not if that colony is not happy, 
or what happens often is once they're established mm. and get to a certain size, a new queen and a small um, contingent of the colony mm. will fly off in a swarm to find a new home. So they kind of okay, okay. spread like that. Okay, but of course, you know, obviously, if you've got if you've got bees, then everything's being pollinated, and you know, it helps yes. everything else grow. Yes, so that is yeah. some to my kind of permaculture and gardening. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Because we've got, um, you've got. Uh, moving on to that, you've got the vegetable jewellery, which of course sounds very peculiar. I have been <laughs> telling people that Becca makes corsets for vegetables, which sounds terrible. <laughs> but I was trying to explain, that, you know, the the kind of what you were doing. So do yeah. you want to tell us a little bit about um, well, that? Yeah. Because um, I I grew up in the city, but then moved to a rural area, and I was very um aware of environmental and um, animal welfare issues. Yes. So during my degree, sorry, this <laughs> this well went on. Um, I some of my work was about kind of GM foods, which was a big thing in the news mm-hmm. then, and intensive mm-hmm. farming. Yeah. And all of that, and that kind of still part of my work. But a few years on, um, the vegetable jewellery um, came from my feeling still about intensive farming because. It just feels wrong mm. to farm animals in that way. Mm. Um, I'm lucky where I live. There's lots of okay. small holdings where yeah. the animals are kept well and happy, yeah. and it's just a much slower, healthier, happier way of yeah. living for, for all involved. Um, but also, um, society's judgment on um, beauty ideals and and yeah and standards in. Um, looks and how different cultures um, literally deform in, in hist- historical and modern times have kind of deformed the human body for um, for beauty. Of so beauty yeah. Corsets, neck rings, um, kind of the stretching and doing on the ears and hips um, and kind of that human obsession with perfection whether it's for the human form or for our vegetables. So food yeah. waste and yeah. That time when supermarkets only wanted perfect yes. fruit. I mean, they have got better now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, so all that food is being. I remember a big debate away. about the size of melons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bizarrely. Um, but yeah, but yes, I mean, so um, what what do you actually make? So what, what are these vegetables? So the vegetable jewellery are um, uh, aesthetically, in my view, <laughs> Beautiful objects in their own right yeah. um, that can also be used, and I want them to be used to deform and alter. change the way, yeah, alter how a fruit or vegetable might grow. Um, which again, I think the result, in my view, is beautiful, mm. and it has that connection to the three junctions, the the mod- morphogenetic method. Uh, way of growth um yeah it just links all my kind of passions i mean i am fascinated by the vegetable jewelry because um i suppose i'm i'm a massive fan of nature yeah it's, you know nature is awesome it's terrifying but it's yeah beautiful. it's incredible it's incredible <laughs> but it's the fact that you see even in urban environments that um uh, trees will change their root yeah. uh, path due to concrete and walls and yeah and, 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 and essentially what, what you're doing is showing just how incredible you know nature is you put a barrier in its way and it goes and that you can sort that push, out. Yeah. <laughs> but push through and round and, and that pressure yeah. of when yeah. there's a fruit growing <laughs> whoops it is within the vegetable jewelry that yeah that pressure and force within again links to the cast iron pieces which were kind of a bit like pressure pushing mm. up from the earth um, and why did you choose to cast an iron because obviously it's, 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 it's really heavy that was uh, just pure luck really um, <laughs> okay. i was really really lucky that um, when I was 16, yeah. I was at art college and just, yeah, in, I still hark back to kind of 16 to 18, I was in my heyday of 
ideas and creativity and playing, and, playing mm. and had access to every department in the art college and I literally used yeah. all of them. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, and my the technician and tutor of the small metals department, mm. so they didn't call it jewelry, they called it small metals. Oh, okay. Which just opened things up a lot for Does it make you go, oh small, maybe big. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he saw how much I loved working in the metal mm. and um, he was part of a group of artists who were building a cupola, oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> which is basically the furnace that yeah. you melt iron in, yeah. um, and making their own moulds and pouring them. And he asked if I'd like to yeah. ha- come along and have be a part of that. Mm. So I jumped at the chance. Mm. And um, for the next decade, I'd, we built, I built another cupola just with him and his partner at his home. and. Um, I kind of became a, an assistant to him. Yeah. yeah. Um, so building the cupola, making moulds, and just yeah, casting iron. So we'd be so on a mountain in the Bracken Beacons mm. in full foundry gear. Oh wow! And there'd be like hikers or people. Oh, oh yeah, back. yeah, I would want to come across that. I'd be like, I'd be like, just like, <laughs> what is that? Like, like, aliens? Yeah, yeah this so huge like, thing with <laughs> fire bursting out. Of it. Yeah, so and, oh, that's um, brilliant. and when you tap the the box, which is yeah. like a load of clay, yeah. refractory clay that holds all that on my yeah. back, and it's a spur, and it is it's basically lava. And I, yeah, was, yeah. Um, I just wanted to poke lava. Like, when you see it, I'm yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you got to so poke the lava. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what was great about having that immediate access to cast mm. iron was we carve into mm. the moulds, which mm. normally if you use a foundry, yeah. you make a pattern yeah, or yeah, yeah, yeah. a wax model of what you want and then it's cast. Um, but yeah, we're directly working on the moulds, carving. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, carving into it and then I learned that the, the deeper it was, the more pressure of iron was behind it, so I could get those deeper kind of yeah, yeah. fins on the cast iron pieces, yeah. and it yeah really yeah. developed from then. And because we use graphite to coat the moulds just before we cast them, yeah. Um, these um, the framing cone pieces because I at that time I had kids. Matthew, who I did the cast iron was, wasn't working with cast iron. It just yeah, I didn't have any access to <laughs> the material, and I wanted that same graphite feel. Feel mm. so it was kind of a mm. a less. So I mean, we have we have one kind of furniture piece here. Yeah. Um, which is something a bit different, but obviously the patterns still repeat in it, and there's something very organic. Yeah. You know, almost <laughs> will it crawl away? Kind of feel. Um, do, have you done any more? Almost functional items, or are you kind of more interested in just the whole form? I um, so I did my degree in fine art sculpture, yeah. And when I left, I just felt not quite able to do what I wanted to do. Um, so I then went, I was very lucky, I got the funding to do um, a blacksmithing. Oh, wow. um, <laughs> Court training, so yeah, I trained as a blacksmith and learned and um, blacksmithing and metal work. So um, learned a lot about more hammering, more, <laughs> more fire, more fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. More dirt. So um, yeah, just learn about forging and dealing with metals and obviously kind of welding and the less fun sciences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, that's where I I've always struggled with saying whether I'm a fine artist or a crafts person. That's why I say maker because yeah, yeah. a lot of my items are functional mm-hmm. um, and I want them to be used. And I, I struggle with the idea of conceptual art just being about the, the concept, the idea. Mm-hmm. I, obviously, that's down to the artist, but my work, I want it to... Be beautiful as well. In, yeah. <laughs> yeah. At least in my eyes, if no one else is. And um, 
and also because of my hang-ups about <laughs> the environment and waste and stuff, I kind of have a, a guilt complex about building things that don't have a use. Okay, okay. So a lot of my sculptural pieces, I kind of often hope that they'll be maybe placed in a garden for nature to kind of colonise and maybe... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they, you can see, like, you, yeah, I mean, you look at them and I think, well, that could look amazing in the garden and things could yeah, really go through it. Or, yeah, and they'll yeah. collect puddles of water which insects yeah. can drink from. Well, water obviously is the source of life in the yeah. garden, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah, so um, just, um, how exciting. No, that's, that's, yeah, it's really, really interesting. Um, so we've got, um, we've got we've got some bowls in the show. We've got we've got jewellery um, for humans to wear as well as the vegetables. Yeah, <laughs> human jewellery. Um, and one chair and some kind of sculptural objects and some very heavy cast iron pieces. Um, so my last question to you would be then, uh, if money was no object and scale was no object, what would be your dream? Um, I don't know, ambition for making. For making. I, even though it would probably mean I'd be less hands on in the making side, yeah. I would love to do something along the, uh, the cast iron pieces. Or, or in bronze, which I do work in bronze occasionally, but huge sculptures that people are invited to climb on and sit on. Right. And eat. Okay. What scale? Come on, give me a Oh, that. like sculpture park scale. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. 20 metres tall. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just big, like maybe 20 metres long and like yeah. 10 metres tall. So, yeah, just, I, so you can create almost like a colony or a hive of people interacting yeah, with Yeah, we'll kind of draw people in and there'll be yeah. kind of areas of shade underneath and, and obviously certain areas would again fill with water and maybe yeah. colonised by plants and wonderful animals but because I went to uni surrounded by a sculpture park that mm. kind of Bretton Hall yeah Bretton yeah. Hall so um, that was like the mm. the aim pinnacle yeah. of <laughs> a Bretton Hall you're making it you're yeah. leaving in a sculpture park yeah. well, we just need a commission here. Just, <laughs> <laughs> and I and again I have no idea how you get like I I know you need to apply for funding <laughs> and opportunities, but getting that toe in the door to become mm. an artist that gets those sort of commissions, I I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's just, just the right time, right place. Well, um, do if you dream and you like never know. Ideas, yeah. You never know. Yeah. Well, um, Growth and Fall by Becca BB is on until the um, 15th of no, 12th of June, get it right now. Uh, 15th of May to the 12th of June, we're open Monday to Saturday, 10 till 6. Come and enjoy. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you. Okay.